Moses, uh, please turn to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. This is a very, very popular passage when dealing with the topic of uh, women, wives, motherhood, all those kind of things. Um, boy, if you've looked at that, that, you know, if you've read through that, it's, it is a high standard. There is a high standard of what it means to be a virtuous woman, okay? So let's have a look at this. Proverbs 31. It is the ladies' turn this time to get preached at. I preached on the men last week. You know, men, I hope you've been loving your wives a little more this week than last. Um, uh, but let's look at Proverbs 31. Verse number 10, the Bible says, Who can find a virtuous woman? Okay, so the title of the sermon tonight is A Virtuous Woman. Now, what I'll get you to do is just keep your finger there in Proverbs 31 and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Because if you remember when I preached on the men last week, I spent a lot of time in Ephesians chapter 5, preaching to the men. But there is a little segment there that I want to cover about women. Ephesians chapter 5, please. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Ephesians 5, 22. The Bible reads, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, you might be thinking, boy, somebody from the 1920s must have written the Bible, right? It says there, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. I mean, that was back then. Not in 2018, surely not. I mean, in 2018, husbands should be submitting themselves to their wives. That's the kind of, that's the mentality that's out there. Okay, that's the mentality that's out there. And unfortunately, even within the church, husbands even are afraid of their wives. Afraid to ask their wives to be submissive to them. Okay, so this is, it really shouldn't be, but this is a hard saying in today's age. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Okay, so when you, when you have your husband, he is, and we'll see in the verse 23 there, for the husband is the head of the wife. God says, wives, that your husband is your head and that you should be submissive to him as unto the Lord. Who's the Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way that you'd be submissive to God himself is the same way that you ought to be submissive to your husband. Wow. You know, wow, that's crazy. You know, 2018, what kind of preaching is this? Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So let's, let's start off with that. Let's talk about what does it mean to be submissive? What does it mean to submit yourself to your husband? Of course, to submit yourself means to lower yourself. Okay, you're, you're actually in the family, in the family unit, wives, you have a lower level of authority than the husband. You are to lower yourself under the authority of your husband. You're, you're, be, you're being put under that authority. Now think about this for a minute. If everybody knew this, okay, if we didn't live in 2018, we lived back in the 1920s, where everybody knew, all the ladies knew, that they had to be submissive to their husbands, don't you think they'd be a little wiser when choosing a husband? All right, don't you think, you know, I, I've got to be submissive to this man for the rest of my life. You know, he's going to look after me, he's going to love me, he's going to care for me, and I've got to make sure that I'm a helpmeet to him, I've got to make sure that I'm submissive to him, then you're going to be extra careful in choosing your marriage partner, aren't you? Because it's a big ask to be submissive unto that person. Okay? Now, this seems crazy, but we are submissive all the time in our lives. Okay? Now, as, I, I, don't, I don't think I put a lot of requirements on you guys as the pastor of this church, but I do have the authority in this church. You know, if, if I were to ask something for, from you within the church while we're gathered together, I would expect that you'd be submissive to that request. Okay, but as, as a pastor who loves the congregation, am I going to be asking you for ridiculous, unnecessary, extremely difficult things to do? Of course not. Okay, I'd be asking you to do things that I know you have the ability to do and to serve in the church. You know, when we um, work, when we have, you know, men, we go to work. Usually we have a boss that we're, we, we have to be submissive under a supervisor, a team leader, a manager. You know, and again, if that boss asks you, hey, I need you to get this project done by the end of today or the end of the week, you've got to be submissive to that, you know? You don't turn around and say, hold on, aren't we equals? You know, yeah, you know this is 2018, boss. You know, we're no longer in the 1920s. You know, surely maybe you should be submissive to me. Surely we should be equal. Hey, maybe, maybe you should be serving me, boss. 
You know, if you said that, yeah, that attitude, you'd be out of the, out that door straight away, right? You'd lose your job. Hey, we're submissive all the time, you know? And the Bible says that we ought, as believers, we ought to be submissive toward one another. That I should hold you higher than, uh, above than I hold myself. Now, as the pastor, yes, I have the authority, but you know what, what it means to be a minister? It means that I am to minister to you. You know, when I'm preaching, um, it might sound like I've got this, this you know, uh, I'm trying to, you know, um, Bible bash you, but I'm actually ministering the Word to you. I'm actually serving you. I'm actually lowering myself so you can be exalted by the preaching of God's Word. Being submissive is not this weird word. It's not something that's unusual. But for some reason, when it comes to marriage, now it's like so weird. What, you're submissive to your husband? You know, you're living in the Stone Age? You know, we do this all the time. Okay, unfortunately, we've been programmed by feminism to say, hey, you know, if, we, if you submit to your husband, then you're saying, you know, you're a lower quality human being or something like that. It's not, it's not true. Okay, you have, all that means is that you're under the authority of your husband and you don't usurp the authority over him. Okay, you have somebody that's your head. And that puts a lot of requirement on your head. Okay, if your husband loves you, isn't he going to treat you good anyway? Isn't he going to look after you anyway? This is why we need preaching both ways. We need husbands, love your wives, and we need wives, submit yourself to your husband. All right, so I just wanted to bring that there. Uh, please turn back to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, verse 10. The Bible begins here, it says, Who can find a virtuous woman, for her price is far above rubies. Now, rubies are precious stone. It is a virtuous woman, hard to find. Okay? It's not that they're impossible to find. It is possible to find them, and it's possible to work toward this. You might look at this list and go, man, I'm far from that. It doesn't mean you can't be a virtuous woman later in your life. It doesn't mean you can't be working toward this thing. It's not like you know, you're either not a virtuous woman or you are a virtuous woman. Hey, it means, hey, this is the standard of what the Bible says a virtuous woman is, and I need to make steps to try to get there. As long as you're making that journey, as long as you're headed in that direction, that's a good thing. It means because you're becoming more valuable, you're becoming more like these rubies, more and far above these rubies, you're becoming far more valuable in the eyes of God in your position as a man's wife, okay? Now, it says virtuous woman, what does it mean to, to what's virtue? What does that mean? It means something that's, that's got a high worth, something that's valuable, okay? Who can find a valuable woman? You know, extreme worth. It also means excellence or highly effective. Who can find an excellent woman? Someone who's very effective for the family, very effective for her husband. The word virtuous also carries the meaning of strength. Okay, now obviously a, a woman, generally speaking, is weaker than a man, you know, just biologically. Uh, but this is obviously not the physical strength, but the, the strength of character, the strength of having good morals. Those kind of things are also very important for a woman. Now if you have a look at verse number 1 there, Proverbs 31 verse 1, I just want to show you this. It says, the words of King Lemuel, so Proverbs, Proverbs uh, 31 is written by King Lemuel, which many believe that to be King Solomon. I think that's a fair assessment. The prophecy that his mother taught him. So he's actually writing about a proverb or a prophecy or a teaching that came straight from his mother. This is what his mother taught him. Okay? And of course, a good mother is going to be teaching her, her son what kind of woman to marry. You know, these are the qualities, son, when you're looking for a wife, these are the qualities that you ought to be looking for, okay? And, you know, this reminds me of just my own personal experience. It wasn't my dad so much that talked to me about who to marry, it was my mum. You know, my mum would say, hey, make sure you marry a woman who's a believer, you know, uh, uh, you know a woman who, who um, you, know, you, know, you know, that you can fall in love with, that you can see a future together, that you have a vision together, you have shared goals, all these kind of things my mum told me. And, you know, as a kid, you're like, Mom, you know, I don't want to talk about these things, you know. But, you know, those things, as you get older, they come to your remembrance. And, you know, when it came to choosing a lady, I, I had my mum's, you know, teaching, nagging me at the back of my head, right, into making the right decision. So, you know, uh, mothers, if you've got sons, please, you know, this is Proverbs 31 for, for girls who, who want to be raised as a virtuous woman, but also to the boys, so they know what kind of woman they need to marry, okay? Or at least be looking for, you know? And uh, look at verse, uh, let's go back to verse 11, Proverbs 31, 11. 
Why is a virtuous woman so important? It says, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. You know, um, so her husband can trust this woman. Now, you know, don't answer this question, wives, you know. Do you believe that your husbands can trust you? You know, do you think that your husband has their full trust in leaving you to, to do, you know, the, your business around the house, to raise the family, or are they lacking in a, in a bit of trust? And if they're lacking in a bit of trust, well, you know, you need to, first of all, be submissive to them, but then start working toward these things that are here in this list. You know, the husband trusts her to take uh, care of the needs of the family and of the house. You know, the husband trusts her that she would not abuse finances. You know, I, I know a lot of men who can't trust their wives with money. I know a lot of them, a lot of my friends, you know, uh, can't trust their wives with money, where they've even had to put uh, restrictions on the credit card, you know, or give them a special card and say, hey, I'm only transferring 100 bucks a day or something like that, because, you know, wives are going out there and, and going crazy and spending the money, you know. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, none of the wives around he uh, here are like that, but hey, the, the husband of the virtuous woman trusts her with, with the finances. He trusts that she would be faithful to him and not seek the attention of other men. His full heart and trust is in his wife. Kind of like we're to believe with, on the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart. It's the same kind of idea. The husband, he trusts his wife, no doubts at all. No doubts at all with all his heart, he trusts in her. To the point there in verse 11, it says, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Now, I was struggling to understand what that meant a little bit, but, you know, uh, what, what, what spoil means is when, um, you know, spoil is the bounty of the, you know, when two nations go to war. Whoever the victorious nation is, you know, they take the resources, they take the bounty, they take the, you know, the valuable things of, of the enemy that they defeated, and we call that the spoil, okay? They take something that didn't belong to them originally, but had gone to war, won that war, and they take that spoil for them. So the fact is, if you're a virtuous woman, your husband can trust you to the point that he has no need for spoil. And what I think that's trying to say is, there's no need for that man to seek attention of some other woman. Some woman that is not his wife. You know, something that doesn't belong to him. He doesn't have need for anything else besides his wife there. Because he has his full trust and dependency upon her. You know, she's there to, uh, to help him uh, in his life. And, and you know, I, I can tell you with an honest heart here that my heart is truly safe with Christina. Okay, I, I just, I, I know she's, she's a faithful wife. She serves me faithfully. I don't even have to worry about so many of the things that she's responsible for. I know she takes care of it. And, uh, you know, that is, that is um, a virtue, I guess, of this woman here in Proverbs 31. Verse number, let's look at verse number 12. She would do him good and not evil all the days of her life. You know, and again, I've told you guys I've worked with a lot of women, right? And, and I hear women complaining about their husbands. And you know what the advice of other women is? You need to get back at him. You need to get back at him, you know? It's like they're, they're wanting to do evil to that man, okay? But it says, no, you will do good to him. Hey, you will be a good wife. And look, I know your husband's not perfect because I'm not perfect. I know Christina doesn't have a perfect husband, okay? And I know you're never going to have this perfect husband. But it says here that you should be desiring to do good to him, okay? Even when he's a bit off, even when he does a bit of wrong, your desire ought to be uh, do good and not get revenge on him, you know? And it says that all the days of her life, hey, marriage is for life. Okay, again, another reason why it's so important to choose the right partner is for life. Okay, and you want to be happy for the rest of your life. You want to find someone that you can truly love for the rest of your life. Make sure you make that right decision. And I'd say to the girls, speak to your dads. Because, you know, I don't think there's, there's going to be very few people besides your dad that would want to make sure you make the best decision in your marriage. You know, I, I would run... You know, any relationship, I know we have young girls, one day you're going to grow up, you're going to be interested in getting married, I'd say run that decision, the man that you're interested in, to your dad, and get your dad's advice, okay? Get your dad's advice. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, she would do him good, and, and I'm thinking about praising their husbands, you know, because the husband does go out and work and provide, and there's nothing sweeter than hearing your wife say thank you. 
You know, thank you for going to work. Thank you for providing. Hey, we've got enough ha- you know, food in our bellies. We've got enough money to be able to run you know, the house and the resources. You know, men appreciate being thanked. And what we're going to see here later on is that the women too need to be thanked and praised. Okay? Look at verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Okay? So wool and flax... Um, it says here that a housewife, basically, let me read that again, nice and loud. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh. Okay? Now, my wife, since I've been married, has been a stay-at-home wife. And you know what people say to me? Is your wife ever going to work? Or why doesn't your wife work? And I'm like, are you crazy? She works more than all you women I put together. She works probably harder than I have in some of the, you know, the cozy office jobs that I've had. Okay? The virtuous woman works. Because being a housewife, being there submissive to their husband, looking after the family, looking after the children, is hard work. Okay? It's not a cozy, cushy job, feet up, watching Dr. Phil. No. You know, you, you've got your attention on your kids, your, your, your concern about the laundry, you know, you're concerned about cleaning the house, you're cons- concerned about food, you know, all these kind of things and all the other, you know, things that you need to get done. You know, if you're, if you're teaching your kids, the education of your kids, hey, you're taking on multiple work, right? At least the school teacher, all they need to worry about is teaching the kids. The housewife teaches the kids and does all these other things. They do a good work. They work hard. And as we see here, this is an example here in, in verse um, number 6. Sorry, verse number 13. It says, She seeketh wool and flax. Now, wool, as you guys probably know, come from sheep or even goats. You can get uh, wool out of goats and sheep. And flax is a, a, uh, is a plant. It's a vegetable. Some linen is made out of vegetables. Some linens are made out of you know, animal you know, coats and uh, wool and things like that. I think what it's saying here is that, you know, in this case, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think any of us have farms or anything like that, right? But in this case, she uses the resources that are available to her, whether that's animals or whether that's plants, and she uses the resources in her house to look after her household. Obviously, with this linen, with this fabric, she makes clothing, okay? Now, you're going to say, well, are you saying, Kevin, that, you know, we ought to, you know, start making our own clothes? I'm, I'm not saying that, okay? In, in this day and age, it's probably easier to get a Kmart and spend five bucks on a shirt or something. I don't know. Is it, maybe it's more than that, ten bucks, okay? Then spending your time, it's probably going to cost you more to actually put the effort in and get all, you know, do the work to have this fabric to work. But the point is, she's a working woman, okay? She's a working woman. And what I want you to understand here is she works with these fabrics in this day and age there, and she develops those skills, okay? I don't want you to think that a housewife is this unskilled, untrained woman. No, it's important to develop skills in your life. And I would say, mothers, you know, I teach your girls to develop skills. You know, you know what it takes to run a household, to run a household effectively. You probably even know what you wish you knew when you got married. Hey, these are things that you ought to be teaching your daughters, you know, when my, when my mum got married, my mum came from a pretty rich family, um, for, like for, for their standards, and they had servants, and the servants would do everything around the house. When my mum got married, she didn't even know how to make a cup of tea. <laughs> I feel sorry for my dad. <laughs> my dad married my mum. Actually, I feel sorry for my mum. Anyway, don't worry, I won't go there. <laughs> but she didn't even know how to make a cup of tea. Right? So after getting married, she had to learn all these skills. But it would have been ideal, obviously, that she would have learnt that growing up. You know, that the servants weren't doing everything. Um, that's what happens, I guess, sometimes when you've got a bit of money, you get other people to do things. But hey, we'll see, this woman had money, okay? She's able to buy vineyards, she's able to buy lands, but even she gets in and develops skills, develops handiworks. It's never too late to develop skills, okay? Uh, look at verse 14. And by the way, by skills, I'm, I'm talking about things like cooking skills, you know, um, you know, educating your daughters are important, okay? Educating your daughters, why? So they can then educate their kids as they grow up. You know, pass on the knowledge that you've developed in your family. Verse 14, she is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. Now, this is not saying you've got to travel far distances to get food. 
Okay, it's using an analogy here. She's like the merchant ships. So it's like the freight ships that take, you know, goods from one nation to another nation, you know, multiple ships. Hey, you know, she, she's able to travel and, and get food. You know, she's interested in finding the best quality food for the best price that she can get. You know, she, she doesn't want to just be the kind of woman that cooks, you know, frozen meals all the time. You know, microwavable meals. Okay, she's not always looking for the lowest quality food. She's there trying to get the best she can to feed her family. She's after looking after her family. Okay, not constantly eating out because that's very expensive. I'm not against eating out, okay, but not constantly doing that because it's very expensive and not always making those microwave dishes, which again, I'm not totally against. Hey, but the low quality, it's not healthy for your family if you make food like that. Hey, you know, like a merchant ship going out, getting all kinds of produce, best quality, best price. That's, that's how she is. Okay, verse 15. She riseth also while it is yet night. So she's an early riser. Okay, she starts early. Okay, um, and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So you can see that she, one of her priorities is to make sure that her household uh, are fed, okay? And she rises up early, I guess for breakfast, making sure that they start on a good diet, okay? They start on a good meal. A lot of people say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I don't know if that's true. That's what they say. But hey, she's up early making sure that her family can be fed. And it says here, and a portion to her maidens. You know what maidens are? They're servants, servant ladies. Now... Let me, let, me, let me say a couple of things here about this chapter. Because if you look at this chapter, it's a huge ask to do all these things. What I want you to understand, as we look at this soon, is that this virtuous woman here had servants, had maid servants there to help. Because in, in some of these households, especially if it's King Solomon, okay, you know, they, um, they would have the servants. And I just told you about how my mom had a lot of servants where she didn't lift a finger, okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with having servants. There's nothing wrong with having help. In fact, right now, my mother-in-law has traveled from Sydney to help my, my wife out with, with the newborn baby. Nothing wrong with having help, okay? But don't be to the point where you've got enough help that you don't even lift a finger yourself. Hey, you need to know what's going on. You need to be the one that takes control. If you're a housewife and you're able, in Australia, I guess we can't afford maid servants in Australia, but let's say we were in a nation where we had that, you would still be the manager, if you want, of those maidservants. They might carry out a lot of the work, but you're still having your hands on top of what's going on. That's what the virtuous woman would do. Okay? And this is why, by the way, she was able to accomplish a lot. Because okay? she did have help. Okay? So I don't want you to look at this list and go, man, this is impossible for me to do. Hey, understand the situation she was in. She had help. And one thing that I'll, I'll, I'll say to, to the you know, wives and mothers, your kids okay, are a big help. You can train them as they grow up to do little things around their house, to do chores around their house. Hey, you're still in control. You're telling them what to do and how often it needs to get done. Hey, but use the help you've got. You know, if you take, unfortunately, you know, a lot of uh, families have this school, uh, children in schools. When they're in schools, they can't help you while they're away, right? But when they're at home, they can get the work done, they can get the chores done during their breaks or after school work is done. Hey, you can have a lot of help um, if you give it thought. You don't need to get the maidservants, you can use your own kids, okay? Look at verse 16. She considereth a field and buyeth it. <laughs> so, do you see how her husband trusts her with money? She sees a field, she goes, hey, this is a good investment, you know, this is going to profit our family. Then she goes out and buys it, okay? With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. So we definitely see here the husband trusting her with the finances. And, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll just say, and I'm not trying to boast, I'm just telling you the truth. You know, with Christina, I trust her 100% with the finances. I don't put any restrictions on her. She can spend whatever she needs to spend. Every now and again, if it's a little bit expensive, she'll run it by me. But she'll tell you 99 out of 100 times, I'm like, yeah, just do it. Like, why are you asking me? Just, just buy it, you know? Uh, because the virtuous woman isn't just trying to spend money for no reason. All right? She's looking, how, how can I help? You know, she's, you know, obviously not trying to, you know, she's looking for the discounts, looking for the vouchers, making sure that, you know, if we're going to buy something, we, first of all, we need it. Or secondly, it's going to help us in the future with this investment here in the vineyard. Um, 
You know, and uh, you know, that's, that's, you can see this woman isn't this stay-at-home slave. She's smart enough to know there's investments to be had and this can help the family, okay? And I also think this is a little bit symbolic, you know, because not all of us can afford a vineyard, right? Not, not all our wives are going to look at Aura and go, wow, there's 800 square meters there and we can afford it, I'm just going to go and buy it. Of course, that's not going to happen. But I also think, and I'll just read to you, you don't need to turn there, I'm going to read from, you to, from Psalm 128, verse 3. Psalm 128, verse 3. It says, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Okay, so I want to take a little bit of a spiritual application there. Okay, I, I know we can't all buy vineyards, okay, but uh, one thing that a wife can be like a vineyard herself, raising children, having children, children like olive plants round about thy table. Obviously, these kids are well behaved. They're able to sit around the table, sit still and eat their dinner, <laughs> you know, instead of running wild, okay? It's the same kind of idea, hey, if you can't afford the vineyard, that's all right. You can be that vineyard yourself. You've got that time there to raise your kids. You've got that time to raise your kids because what's, what's a greater investment to you? A piece of land or your own children? Surely it's your own children that you'd want to spend more time investing them, train them, Hopefully so they don't make the same mistakes that we've made, right? They can do, go far and beyond above what we've achieved in our lives. Verse 17, verse 17. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Now again, we know that women generally and biologically speaking, you know, women are weaker, you know, physically weaker than a man. But you know, managing a house requires strength. I mean, uh, as I was going through this, I was thinking about Christina, and she's always on her feet. You know, I mean, even after giving birth, she's on her feet. You know? um, because that's what's going to take, right? To, to, to look after a house, raising kids. It's not like you can just sit there and put your feet up all the time. You know, if, if, you, if you're doing a good job, if you're working, it is work. You're going to develop strength, okay? She's not lazy. She's not idle. She's constantly working with her hands and strengthening her arms just by doing the things that she needs to get done around the house, okay? And I, I, just, I was thinking about, you know how some girls are, are, are too afraid to break a fingernail? You know, they're, they're so princessy. You know, and, and look, I'm all for feminist. Fe, sorry, fem. <laughs> I'm all for feminism. No, not feminism. I'm all for, what's the word I'm looking for? Femininity. Femininity. Thank you. I'm all for femininity. All right? I'd rather they be that princess that's afraid to break their fingernail than try to be some butch man. Okay? But at the same time, she, you know, she, she can't be afraid to break that fingernail. She can't be afraid to get her hands a little bit dirty and work. Okay? You know, she, you know uh, girls, don't think that when you get married, you're marrying some prince and you're going to live in a castle and you're going to have all these servants running around and you're just going to, I don't know, what, are they, what do princesses do? I don't even know, ride, ride unicorns or anything like that. You know, that's, not, that's not real, okay? That's not realistic, okay? We, we don't live in Disney, you know? It's, you're not a Disney princess. So, you know, promoting femininity is important, but uh, not to the point that they become a useless, you know, Disney princess. That's not what you want for your daughters, okay? They, they, they need to be able to work as well. They need to understand that when I get married, I've got to put my effort in, and that's the reality of it, okay? Uh, Strong women, okay? Strong women in that sense. You know, a feminine, strong woman. Okay, all right. Verse 18. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. Wow. So we saw that she rises up early while it's still night, and now we see that her candle goeth not out by night. So she's up late as well. Okay, she's up late as well. Um, she layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. I don't even know what the distaff is. I'm assuming this is, you know, uh, making clothing or stuff like that. I'm not sure what spindle. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of something that spins and makes linen. Uh, anyone know what a distaff is? I should look that up. I don't know. Um, but obviously, um, she, she can, she's productive. She's, she's efficient. You know, she's making clothing. But what, what I want to point out there to you guys is that she's up early, yes, to, to make sure her household is being fed, but she's up at night still working. Okay, because getting married, being a housewife, being a mother is a 24-7 job. It doesn't end. 
You know, the last two nights we had the newborn crying, 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 crying. And Christ I can't help it. Christina has to breastfeed that baby. She's up. She doesn't get a rest, right? 24-7, she's a mum. 24-7, she's a mum. And this is the kind of idea that I think of is that, hey, your, your, your job as a mother, as a housewife, never ends. You know, it starts from the time you, you wake up to the time you fall asleep, you know, go to bed. You know, that's just, that's how it is, you know. She's not idle, she's working. Now, you might say, well, hold on, does, does that mean God doesn't want women to, to sleep? You know, up early at night. I'll just quickly read to you Psalm 127, verse 2. It says, It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. You know, God calls you his beloved. God wants you to sleep. God wants you to recharge your batteries and get the rest. But doesn't want you waking up early and going to sleep late, eating the bread of sorrows. Woe is my life! Or being idle and being a troublemaker. No, he wants us up, he wants us up and, 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 and being as productive as we can in our lives. Okay? Not to be these idle, you know, full of sorrow people, but being effective, being productive. These are good reasons to maybe having to stay up at night or things like that. Okay? Verse number 20. Verse number 20. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. needy. So you can see that she's considerate of others that are in need. Okay, she's able to see others in need and offer help. Now, often when I read these passages in the Bible, I would like to be more helpful to the needy, but we live in a, such a rich nation. I mean, I don't even find needy people. Like, everyone's got what they need, okay? And um, actually, when I was down in Sydney, I was having lunch with my brother, and we had this lady um, walk up to us and say, hey, can you spare a few, you know, some dollars? Can you spare some change? You know, I've got to catch the bus from here to some location. Now, if you've, you know, if, if that's the first time you come across someone like that, you, you might get fooled by it. But that's, it's the same story every time with these people, right? I know she's not needy. I know she's just going around collecting money and she's probably going to, you know, go to the, to the pub and drink alcohol with the money that she collects. Okay, that's, Australians are not needy. Okay, and I was just talking, was I talking to you about this? Like, like homeless Australians are homeless on purpose. Honestly, because even in Australia, the government gives you a house. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that, you know, have housing commission. I don't really see this happen, but I just want to, I do want to apply this to some, in some ways. And, you know, again, I want to think about our church family that we have. You know, obviously I would love to see our church, and I think we have a great church. I think we have a solid church that actually cares for each other. But I want you to just be mindful if you do see someone in our church that has a need, hey, and you can fulfill that need, then offer, you know, offer that. Otherwise, ask them, hey, is there anything that I can be praying for you about? Is there anything that I can do to help you? You know, I'm thinking about, you know, um, you know well, Christina's got her mum helping her, but I'm thinking of Yasmin, first time mum. Hey, she might need some help. She might need, you know, you know maybe we can, you know, I don't know if she, you know, she'd be interested in pizza. We can order pizza, send it her way once in a while. Just do little things that we can be helpful to one another, okay? Uh, but, but women, this is something that you guys are actually better at. Men, we don't really notice when people are in need. <laughs> but women actually pick these, up, think, these, pick these things up a lot more. But you can see that she's considerate, the, the virtuous woman, and she's generous. And I believe the reason why she's generous is because she doesn't waste her money. Okay, we saw this. Her husband trusts her. You know, she takes care of all the things and she still has left over in, 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 in order to be able to help other people. She's generous to others, but she ensures that her family is taken care of as well. Verse 21. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So she's not afraid of the winter months. We don't have snow here. It's never snowed up here on the Sunshine Coast? No. Okay, uh, she's not afraid of snow, she's not, af not afraid of the cold weather. Why? Because she's well prepared. You know, she's got warm clothing for her family. She's got warm clothing for her kids. She's thought that through. Hey, it's going to get cold these few months. I want to make sure that there's enough jumpers and jackets and things to keep us warm. That's why she's not afraid of the snow to come. She's not afraid of that. And it says there, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Now, scarlet is a bright red color. Now, uh, you know, I don't, who's, no one's dressed in scarlet right here. Uh, does that mean no one's a virtuous woman? No, I think what's, what's being said here is because, you know, um, in winter, you know, people think of it like a, as... If you see people wear, wear winter clothing, isn't it normally like black and grey and uh, sort of colourless? 
But when it gets to spring and summer, it's a lot more colourful. Okay? So what, I'm think, what, what I think this is talking about here is that even in winter, the family is dressed well. Even in winter, hey, um, you know, they've got bright and happy clothing, is, is, is what I think is going on. They aren't dressed in daggy old clothing that's fallen apart. She makes sure that her family is taken care of. And as you can see, a lot of this stuff is common sense. You know, when you think of a housewife, you know, clothe, you know clothing the family, feeding the family, looking after the household, all these things are true. All these things are found here in this chapter. Verse 22, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So she doesn't just take care of her, the clothing of her family. Hey, she dresses up a little bit herself. When you think of the clothing of silk and purple, it's often associated with royalty, right? Royalty clothing. Hey, she gets material and colors associated with royalty. Hey, she tries to look nice. She tries to look presentable. You know, it's not like she, you know, she's, you know, trying to look like, you know, look trashy with her hair uncombed, you know, um, in the worst kind of clothing. You know, she tries to look, uh, you know, hopefully attractive for her husband, but also presentable to other people around her. Look at verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. And um, I don't want to talk about hu to husbands here, but I think this, is, this is, goes, goes back to the idea of who are you going to marry? What kind of man are you going to be looking for? Because look at the wise decision she made. She married a man that is known in the gates. Hey, he's got a good reputation, okay? He's got a good reputation. He's a man of good character, hopefully a man of godly character, and he sitteth among the elders of the land, meaning that he's wise. He's got knowledge, okay? He's wise, he's knowledgeable, a wise man, good character, good reputation. That's the man you need to be looking for. Not, not the bad boy, you know? Not, 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 not the one that's, you know, drinking alcohol, getting drunk, taking drugs, wasting his money. That's not the guy you're looking to marry. You, you should be looking for someone with godly character, good reputation, wise, who loves the Lord, okay? She made a right decision here in, in who she married. Verse 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. So she helps with the finances. You know, nothing wrong with making a little bit of money. You know, it's, it's not the fact that a woman makes money that, that, that I'm against. I'm, just, I'm against us sending our women into the workforce who aren't looking after their children. They put their children in the hands of other people and then the husbands aren't really being the main breadwinner. Okay, they, they give that responsibility onto their wives. That's wrong. Hey, but there's nothing wrong with a wife making a bit of money. You know, again, I'm, I just, I'm just giving you examples of my wife when she had more time, when she had less kids. You know, the kids would grow out of clothing. She'd sell it on eBay, make a bit of profit, you know. Sometimes, you know, in winter, she'd buy summer clothes, secondhand summer clothes. In summer, she'd buy secondhand winter clothes. And because she bought it out of season, she bought like great quality clothing. Stuff that would be in the wash, you'd put in the wash and it would still look brand new. And then she'd sell it, and, like third hand. And many times, and she'd sell it in season, right? And so when, when you're buying it, like selling it in season, obviously you're going to get more money for it. And many times she was able to sell the same clothing third hand for more than what she purchased it second hand that first time, okay? Now we don't do that so much now because we've got so many kids, it's all pass me downs. By the time it gets to the last one, it's ripped and fallen apart anyway. So we don't do that. Some, but look, if there's nothing wrong with a woman finding a way to make a bit of money and helping out, as long as the other priorities are in place first. Okay? Verse 26. Sorry, what was I? Did I miss one? 25, right? Yeah, verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. So I spoke about how a woman, you know, um, you know, does look after herself, make sure she's presentable, dresses well. But what is her actual clothing? This is obviously, um, uh, it says here that it's, it's strength and honor. Okay, so a woman, yes, ought to try to look pretty, nice, attractive to her husband. But what really should be, should be clothed with is strength and honor. Hey, these are qualities. These are moral qualities about themselves. If you can keep your finger there, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Now, I'm going to read this verse, and I'll tell you how a lot of people misinterpret this verse, but verse number 9, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, it says here, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So some people have misunderstood this verse. I've heard it taught that this, the Bible is teaching here that it's wrong for women to fix their hair up, you know, to braids. Is that broidered? It must be braids. Um, or to put on jewellery, says so they're, you know, of not gold or pearls or costly array. That's not what it's saying. Okay, it's not saying that it's sinful or wrong for a woman to dress up a little bit, fix their hair, put a bit of, you know, makeup or jewellery. It's not saying that's wrong, okay? But that ought not to be what they're known for. Okay, that's not that ought not to be the main thing about a woman. Okay, the main thing there that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Okay, so these these are important qualities that a woman needs to adorn herself with. Let's talk about that shamefacedness there. Okay, shamefacedness means basically not just modest in clothing, but modest in their personality. Modest in their personality, not seeking to be the center of attention. Okay, not seeking to be that loud, obnoxious woman that frustrates everybody. <laughs> okay, no, hey, um, have some shame, have some modesty, you know, uh, again, that submissive to your husband kind of thing. And then it says uh, sobriety as well. So, not a woman that's silly and immature, uh, but someone that is serious and responsible. It's a woman that is serious and responsible, that is modest. That's how a woman ought to uh, clothe herself, okay? And as we saw in, in, in Proverbs 31, strength and honor, an honorable woman, okay? But when you look at the opposite, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of women these days, um, especially in our you know, newer, newer generations, are those loud, obnoxious women, right? They are the silly and immature women, okay? And they're foolish, and men take advantage of them. Men abuse them, take advantage of them, and then they wonder why they can never settle down and find a husband. Okay, because they're not wife material. Okay, they're not wife material, and you have the worldly men that just take advantage, you know, and, and, you know, but really they're looking for a better woman as for a wife. Okay, they get all the attention now, but, you know, they're not taken seriously. Okay, they're not taken seriously. So we need to make sure that, yes, I, I do... You know, I do think it's nice for a woman to, to look presentable, look nice, fix themselves up, you know, look nice for their husbands, all that kind of stuff. But more important is your character. And that's really a lot of this is character building for a woman, okay? Verse uh, 26, back to uh, Pro Proverbs 31, please. Proverbs 31, verse 26. Uh, she openeth her mouth with wisdom. She's wise. You know, women, you need to strive for wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. Boy, I've met some really unkind women in my life. <laughs> All right. Women that just want to attack. Women that just want to destroy. Women that want to destroy anybody else's happiness because they, they're miserable. And no, you know, a virtuous woman has a tongue of kindness. Okay, they're there to lift up others, to edify one another. Hey, if, if a woman is speaking to another woman that has problems, they're not trying to tear them down. They're just trying to lovingly give them counsel and advice with kindness. That's what you need to be working toward. I think a lot of women struggle with this area, in this area. I'm not saying anyone here. I don't know. Husbands, maybe you know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know your wives. But I'm just saying, I, I do see this as a major issue among a lot of women today, not having that, lung, that tongue of kindness. Um... You know, um, she has wisdom. And I often think about the fact that this woman, she's slower to speak. She considers things that happen, you know, th is thoughtful about the situation and then speaks. Okay, because we're very tempted when, we, when, we, when we're very opinionated, you know, when someone does something wrong, we're very tempted to speak quickly. But when you do that, you can speak a lot of foolishness. You can speak a lot of unkind words. Okay, now if... if if you see me sometimes just go quiet, it's because I'm thinking about something kind to say. <laughs> okay? Because it takes time, right? It takes time to be thoughtful, to think of something wise and kind to say. It takes more work. Hey, but the virtuous woman is able to do that. She's able to accomplish that. Verse 27. She looketh well to the ways of her household 
and eateth not the bread of idleness. We already discussed that, you know, she's not idle. She's got a lot of work to do, you know. And a lot, you know, people get turned off by work. But again, if we're, if we're striving and we're doing the things that God has, has given us instinctive to do and we're accomplishing those things and we're being successful in those things, it's going to give you great joy. It's going to give you great satisfaction to do these things. It's not depressing to work. A lot of people think, oh man, I, I just want to get the day over so I can rest and, and enjoy the... Re-. Hey, you can actually find enjoyment in work as long as you're doing it right in, in the right ways, Okay. And if, if, if as a wife, you're looking after your husband, looking after your family, and you put that as your priority and stop listening to the feminists on the television, you are going to find great joy in your life. You are going to find great satisfaction in your life. You should look well to the ways of her household. Verse 28. <clears throat> I'm almost done here. It says, her children arise up. So she d- desires to have children. She wants to be a mother. You know, she wants to have more than one child, children. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Hey, her children praise her, okay? Now, if you hear children praising their mum, you probably have a virtuous woman on your hands there because even the children recognise her value. Even children recognise, this is a great mum that I have. And kids, let me say, you ought to be praising your mums. They work real hard, you know, to raise you, to love you and to nurture you. And then it says here, her husband also, and he praiseth her. He praiseth. Men, we need to praise our wives. We need to praise our wives. They work hard. They do. They work hard. They raise the kids, look after us. You know, sometimes when you're at work, you don't see all the work that they do, you know, and they might feel underappreciated. And I think what we'll see here in the next few verses is that women, you know, are virtuous women, stay at home mothers that are looking after their families, need to be praised. We'll see this not just in verse 28, okay? Um, verse, verse 29 here is an example of the praise, you know, how he praises her. It says, Man, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excelleth them all. <laughs> so this is like the husband saying to his wife, Hey, wife, you know, there's a lot of good women out there, a lot of good mothers, a lot of good wives out there, but thou excelleth, excelleth them all. You're better than all of them. <laughs> You know, that's, that's the kind of praise that you need to be saying to your wife, okay? They cook a good dish. Honey, that's the best meal I've had. That's the best spaghetti bolognese that I've ever eaten. Hey, that's going to give them, you know, joy and praise, you know? Don't say, I was good, but, you know, the lady in church, you know, cooked better last time. That, that's not praising your wife, okay? That's not praising your wife. You're the best. You're the best. Verse 30. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Okay? So the virtuous woman fears the Lord. She's spiritual. She's godly. She wants to know the things of the Lord. You know, she's in a position to teach her kids. She should be teaching them the Bible and training them uh, of doctrines. Okay? That's a great place for you to take, you know, not in the church, not to stand up behind the pulpit, teaching the Word of God, but you can teach your kids at home. Even better, teach your kids so they can know the Word of God. Fear in the Lord. She's here being praised. She shall be praised. You see that? She's praised for being a godly wife. Praised for being a spiritual woman. Praised for fearing the Lord. That's something else they ought to be praised for. That's something else a virtuous woman ought to be doing, right? Getting into the Bible, wanting, desiring the Word of God. And again, we've already discussed this last week. Men, you're the spiritual head. You should be teaching your wives as well. Okay? Verse 31. Give her, look at this. Give her of the fruits of her hands. Hey, your wife is not your slave. Okay? She works. She deserves the fruit of her hands. She deserves reward. She deserves, you know, I don't know if they're into flowers. She deserves flowers once in a while with a box of chocolates. She deserves to be taken out on a date. She deserves having a nice little gift from you once in a while. She deserves, you know, everything that she's, she's working for, okay? It's not like, well, that's your job anyway. You know, get in the kitchen and make me a sandwich, right? Now, you might have that attitude sometimes if the sandwich isn't there. But I'm just saying, hey, if they do the work, they ought to be given. They ought to be rewarded and praised. Look at this. And let her own ha- works praise her in the gates you ought to be speaking well of your wife 
You know, um, I, I don't know if we probably don't do this all that much because we're doing Bible study. Hey, but, you know, we ought to be praising our wives. You know, we ought to be praising the works that our wives have done. We ought to be praising her so that her own works are praised in the gates. That it's heard by other people. You ought to be talking up your wife. Right? Look at verse, tw- look at verse 28 again. Verse 28. And he praiseth her. Verse 30. Uh, she shall be praised. Verse 31. Her own works praise her in the gates. Hey, this virtuous woman ought to be praised, ought to be praised, ought to be praised. You know what this tells me? Is that women that work hard like this are going to get to a point where they don't feel valued. They don't feel appreciated. Which means we need to remind them to, be, to praise them. Okay? Uh, and again, if they're listening to this world... If they're listening to their ungodly family and friends, if they're listening to the media, they're going to, feel, they're going to be told they're undervalued. They're going to be told you're wasting your life raising your kids. They're going to be told you can be doing greater things for your life. And that's why we need to praise them for what they do. We need to praise them for what they do because the world is not praising them. Okay? It's not like the world's being quiet. The world's actually putting them down. That's what's going on. The opposite to what the Word of God says. And so, uh, mothers, wives, if you're a stay-at-home mother, raising your kids, striving to be this virtuous woman, you know, you might say, well, my husband's not really praising me. Look, God praises you. This is the Word of God. And He says, you're worthy of being praised. And just husbands, look, seriously, they, they probably deserve a little more than what we're giving them sometimes. You know, um, what, what did it say there? Again, in verse 31, give her of the fruit of her hands. You know, this tells me that she's not looking to um, reward herself. Others need to step in and, and value her and reward her and, and praise her. Okay? Now, just in conclusion, guys, just in conclusion, I'll get you to turn to, I'll get you to, turn to Proverbs chapter 12, since you're in Proverbs already. Proverbs chapter 12. Now, this word virtuous or the, the term virtuous woman only ap- appears three times in the Bible. So I've already covered the first time where it's covered. That's in Proverbs 31. I just want to quickly, just in conclusion, cover the other two places where we find it. So we get a little bit more information. But we won't spend too much time on it. You guys turn to Proverbs chapter 12. <clears throat> and I'll just, um, I'll read to you from Ruth chapter 3. Now, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Ruth in the Bible. She's actually one of the, this, uh, not descendants, um, how would you say it, of Jesus Christ. One of the ancestors. One of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. And um, it says here in, in Ruth chapter 3, verse 11, uh, she married Boaz. Maybe you're familiar with the, with the guy called Boaz in the Bible. Ruth chapter 3, verse 11, it says, uh, Boaz speaking to Ruth, who, she, who he marries. It says, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now, I guess the only thing I want to drive from there is that a woman that is virtuous, Boaz, who, was, who ended up marrying her, says, hey, I will do all that you require. <laughs> Meaning that if you strive to be this virtuous woman, your husband's going to be driven to do more for you. <laughs> your husband's going to be driven to, to fulfill all your needs and all your requirements that, he, that you have. Okay, you might be saying my husband is not appreciated. Hey, maybe work toward being that virtuous woman. He's going to get to a point where he can't help himself but do everything he can to, to, uh, to lift you up and to supply your every need. Okay, but go to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4. Let's look at the other reference. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4. It says, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. Wow, a valuable crown. You know, it makes your husband. A virtuous woman will make your husband look better than he is. That's the truth. You know, if I didn't have Christina, I wouldn't look as good as I do. Right? I, I think of her as a virtuous woman. Okay? I'm not saying she's perfect. You know, none of us are perfect. We can all work toward these things. But hey, you can actually make your husband look better in front of everybody. Okay? By just being that virtuous, faithful wife. You know? And uh, what's a crown? You know, it's something that's valuable. Something that, that um, it, it adds authority to that man. It adds respectability to that man. Okay? You can actually cause your husband to be, to be respected in the community just by being a great wife, just by being that, this, this great woman. But look at the flip side. It says, But she that maketh ashamed 
is as rottenness in his bones. Wow. <laughs> right? A, a woman, that, uh, a wife that a man is ashamed of, it's like, rot, like, rot, like a rotting of your bones. Look, makes you sickly. Um, it's just the opposite to the virtuous woman. She's an embarrassment to her husband. Okay? So I just want to end with that. Which one are you going to be? Are you going to be that crown to your husband? Or are you going to be like rottenness to his bones? That's what the Bible says. I didn't make that up. Okay? You've got to choose between one of those two things. What are you going to strive to do? All right, let's pray.